Oh snap, it's mind pump time. Welcome to the best fitness and entertainment podcast in the universe. Used to be on Earth, and then I realized there aren't other podcasts uh, anywhere else. So it's in the universe, actually. So we're actually better than we thought, Justin. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Anyway, here's today's giveaway. How would you like to be a part of one of the best fitness groups in Facebook? Okay, so we have a private forum that you can go in. Normally, you have to pay for this. You get in there. There's other trainers, other fitness professionals, other fitness enthusiasts. You can ask questions. You can have fun. You can share memes. You can get into crazy debates. It's a good time. It's also a little wild. Anyway, today's giveaway is free access to the Mind Pump private form. Here's how you can get that. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Make it a good comment. Also, subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. If we pick your comment, we'll let you in the forum for free. No money whatsoever. Also, we have two workout programs on sale right now. MAPS Performance and MAPS Suspension, both 50% off. Go check them out. Head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just don't forget to use the code SEPTEMBER50 with no space for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Lori, always great to have you. You're one of our favorite people on social media, let alone favorite females on social media, just favorite people in general because you are one of the few people that presents accurate, good information consistently. So we're happy to have you. Thank you. Come on, come on the show. Um, so uh, you you had some ideas of stuff you want to talk about, and we all love the idea. So essentially, it's like some of the biggest lies that women yeah. are told. So we, the- we were going to talk about kind of the biggest lies that women are sold or told in the fitness industry and, and nutrition industry, um, because it's like, there's so much poor messaging out there and there's so much snake oil. And I think ultimately when we look at nutrition and we look at fitness, we can make money off of it and people can monetize it. And so it's like the more sexy, the more extreme, the better it sells. Like the the, the classic stuff mm-hmm. doesn't sell well, but you tell somebody, oh, hey, I want you to do this really extreme thing and it's going to be really hard and you're going to suffer a lot to do. And people are like, oh, yeah, like sign me up. I'm right? listening. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? I that- feel like women have been sold more lies in the fitness space than men too. Do you guys think oh, you agree? Mm-hmm. Totally. They're targeted uh, constantly. Part of it, I think, and I'd love your input on this, Lori. Part of it, I think, is that women uh, are, they make up a, a larger percentage of the just consumer base in general. Oh, yeah, for so th- sure. Yeah, I they- mean, men don't buy things. Mm. <laughs> like women, <laughs> women love buying things. Mm. So that's, that naturally happens as well. You know, it's like, I'm sure I would love to hear, is, like, even with Mind Pump Media, how many consumers are actually female versus male? Because I would assume it'd probably be. You know, it's funny, as a trainer, uh, I'd say 70% of my clients at least were women. And I think that's true for most trainers. With Mind Pump Media, it's pretty close 50-50, I would okay. say, which is not bad considering it's it's just a bunch of it's three dudes <laughs> yeah. talking yeah. fitness, right? So what does that tell you? That but yeah, very, that we're very feminine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we try. I mean, yeah. We try to team uh, but down, I but. I do think it's the other reason is that uh, women also historically have been targeted and told that they're not beautiful enough, they don't look good enough. They're not, you know, up to par and, oh, here's our makeup, here's our shoes, here's your dress, here's the things you could do to make yourself look better. So it's like natural that we could move that into the fitness space and use the same tactics and, oh, and yeah. get people I mean, I mean, the industry tells you that you need to be leaner and you need to be thinner, but you need to be more athletic looking, but, you know, you can't be too small. You have to have a big butt too. You know, it's like, it's (laughs) all these things and it's like this moving target that's like, you just can't do it. Like, I think uh, my best friend and I were actually joking about this and I was like, man, I would love to just make a social media post and be just like, you know, one spot would say like, have a big butt, have abs, and then like, you know, like being able to lift heavy weights, performance, whatever, and be like, pick two. Like you can't do, it's really hard to do all three. And and yeah, you know, most people are like, oh, well, I want a really big butt, uh, but I also want to be shredded and I want to have a six pack, but I want to be able to like hit PRs and, you know, lift all the weights. And it's like, ah, like we, we can kind of get the best of both worlds, but it's like, they're all different opposite spectrums, right? Like one involves 
having a lot of food and, you know, actually being able to recover. And then, you know, it's like, well, if you want a six pack, like you got to be tiny, you got to be lean. Like you're probably not eating, you know, tons of food, but you know, like if you want a big butt, like you you can't have a big juicy booty and not have the calories to, you know, for your body to create that. Right. I think that I, I almost think too, that this it's getting worse before it's getting better. And I think some of it has to do with, I I dropped this stat on, uh, on the show, like, I don't know, a long time ago when I first looked up, there's an app. I forget the name of the app, but it's the, it's like the most, one of the most downloaded apps that allows you to kind of like manipulate your face and your body. It's like, it's one of those filter apps. Like Facetune or something. Yes. I think that might be it. Like, and the amount of people that actually use that is like crazy. And so I, and I, I'll never forget the first time that I saw my two nieces. I have two nieces and a cousin and these were different situations that, and I would have never guessed that they use it because I see their their Instagram and it, I and I know them in person, so that they look like it. I guess I've never really investigated, but even the the slightest little details, I I, I caught my my cousin doing this where there was a post of her and her girlfriends on on the beach in a bikini, and she just you know shaved her hips in just mm. a just a tiny bit more because it was just a bad angle where she's at, and it's and and they like justified as like well you don't want to do a lot because then that's really fake and people but it's become common practice to manipulate those things so i think that's perpetuating the problem is like oh, people well, think but, like but they but see think kim kardashian social you know? media in general right because and i mean i'm guilty of this too it's you know like if i'm filming a lifting set i might you know set up my camera i look at it after i'm like oh that was not a good angle and then you know you move the camera three or four inches you know a different direction and you look totally different right and it's a, even i would say that you know it's like we'll film with really high quality like sony cameras that are you know shooting in 4k and then if you shoot with your iPhone, like it looks like you're shooting with a potato, right? And so it's like, <laughs> I actually would love, I've been meaning to do that where it's like, you know, film one set with like the nice camera and then film one set with well, my phone cool. and be like, by the way, like this is the same body, yeah, but like one can day. pick up more pixels, yeah. more details. Cause mm. it's like, I think again, you know, it's like on social media, like I'm five three and, and feedback I get all the time when people meet me in real life is like, oh, I, I thought you were like five eight. And it's just like, well, I mean, my, my phone's always on the floor. <laughs> like it, I looked tall, but I'm not tall, right? We so. met. We met. I don't remember where we were traveling. We were like, uh, we were at an airport, and then we seen this guy. I'm not gonna call him out, but we seen this dude that's got like mm. a big Instagram following. Uh, yeah, and Adam's like, dude, he's like five three. I, th- I had no idea. And <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. you look at his page, and you think he's like six yeah. foot tall. But it's just well, dude. after I remember afterwards, I because I was so blown away by how much shorter he was in real life, and then I went and it, you to the point you're making right now is he does a really good job of like shooting all his photos like down to up. Yeah, like right? you learn your angles. Yeah. Like it just, you know, like yeah. that's, uh, it just kind of comes naturally. It's not like you're, you're trying to do yeah. anything special or <laughs> smoke mirrors. It's just like you learn what angles look good. You know, you learn what doesn't, but it's like for most people, you know, on social media, and I mean, they've done Netflix documentaries about this now where it's like how bad social media is for people's health because Uh, You know, it's like, even if I'm doing this, if I'm on my story, I'm probably using a filter. You know, it's like, I would never just like snap a picture and like pop it up on my feed. You know, it's like, I'm probably going to use some sort of preset so that it matches, you know, the color and the vibe and the feel of my feed or, you know, stuff like that. So it's like, we just live in this world where everything's a little bit doctored and it's because our normal and you you just get used to it. Not only that, but it's also kind of it's almost it's it's hard to to judge someone for doing that when uh, the algorithm and the views pay you to do that and you're running a business so how can i judge you for kind of doing that it's like hey listen this is my livelihood and hey if i match my photos all with kind of the same filter and it gets 10 percent more views it would be almost silly not to do that so well you made a comment earlier and i think this is important um to know so you said that it's really easy to sell fitness when it's sexy extreme crazy you make crazy false promises and that's 100 percent true right it's always been like that in the fitness space if i can tell if i tell you take this pill and you'll lose 30 pounds in 30 days and here's these before and afters that's easy to sell versus hey, if you hire me, it's going to take a year and a half to lose 30 pounds. It's going to be a lot of hard work. We have to change all these different behaviors and all that stuff. So it's totally true. So one thing that we've done with with Mind Pump that I see you doing as well is you fight fire with fire. In other words, 
you use similar tactics, but you sell the truth. And that is very hard to do. It's mm -hmm. very hard to sell the truth. So you have to be very smart with how you do it. You have to find a good angle because the it, this is a fight. It's a battle over the, you know, whatever, the minds and souls of people who are trying to get in better shape. Because the truth is, although there's a lot of issues and problems in the fitness industry, here's the other side of it. It's the only industry I can I know of that actually has the solutions for our health epidemics. There's the only people in the fitness space, there are only people in the fitness space that I know of that actually can communicate effectively proper relationships with food and loving your body. So it's, you know, in, in, in real ways. So it's like, you know, we have to figure out how to outsell the shitty ideas with yeah. the right ideas. Well, because so. like you said, you know, it's like sex sells and I think it's so easy and, uh, you know, it's like Paragon Training Methods, my company, we were guilty of this too. It's like when we started our company, Back in 2018, if we did photo shoots, if we were shooting anything, you know, for social media or the website, it would be like, I'm in a sports bra, super tiny shorts, sure. like my business partner, Brian, would be, you know, shirtless. And and so it's so funny now because it's like if you look at our social media, if you look at our website, it's like, I want clothes on. Like, I don't want my body to be the focus because that's not what we're about. And also, you know, it's like I don't want to be selling the idea that being, you know, a thin white female is the ideal body type. Right. It's like that's one body type. But, you know, so many there's so many different body types out there and all of them are are worth celebrating. But health doesn't have a size. Right. Like health and wellness doesn't have a size. And so it's like, you know, when we start looking at messaging, it's like that was a conscious decision we made where it was like, yo, like when we are shooting content for our company now, it's like. I just want you to be, you know, it's like we want to create FOMO and we want people to see our workouts and be like, dang, you're like these people look like they're having so much fun. Like, I want to be a part of that rather than, again, you're just like, ooh, look at my body. Look at how, you yeah. know, shred I am or jacked I am. And so it's like with both our companies, you know, it's like what we do a really good job of is we're education first because education drives empowerment. Right. So it's like with you guys, you have a podcast, you know, you have blogs that you're putting out. You're putting out content every single day for free because there shouldn't be a barrier of access to people loving their body and understanding how to you know effectively reach their goals right and so it's like when people ask my why it's like every day like that's all i do is just put out free content and i'm looking at what are people struggling with how do we put out resources for people to no longer be at war with their body to love their body to effectively you know whether it's you're trying to lose body fat and get healthier or you know you're trying to gain muscle you're trying to get a more athletic figure you know there's so much bullshit to weed mm. through and so how do we effectively help people yeah. get there it's it's education first and we don't get that in school we don't you know how many people go through school they graduate maybe they even get a master's and it's like they still don't know how to feed themselves and they yeah. don't know how to eat healthier you know again they don't know the <clears throat> types of exercise modalities they should be doing to elicit certain responses you know it's like we we skip that and i don't know i was thinking about this recently where it's like i don't know that i wish there was more education because i feel like the nutrition education we would get wouldn't be good, right? right. It'd be like, okay, I'm sure it'd be like the 90s outdated stuff of like, well, you should- uh, The food like, pyramid's a great Yeah, like food yes. pyramid's great. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, so it's like, I don't, I don't know which is better of maybe if we received outdated information or again, you know, stuff that's very government run and this and that, whatever, versus like the no education that we get. And so it's like for most people, it's like you hit your 20s or maybe it's the time that you start having kids and you're like, oh, I need to learn how to actually take mm. care of my body. Here I have this little kid that like is going to be dependent on me for food. I got to figure this out. And so, you know, it, it's such a bizarre and broken system because the reality of the situation is like, we we eat food our entire lives and we don't know you know, we don't have any no. occasion you know education or understanding around that and so where do we turn to well the, you know in, in my generation it was like you would go to the drugstore and pick up like cosmopolitan shape magazine you know, stuff mm -hmm. like that now it's like you have pinterest and we know that pinterest is kind of where dreams go to die and then present day you know it's like you have <laughs> you have social media and and you know it's like there are great people that are you know there's content creators that are putting out great you know information and then equal parts you know terrible information <laughs> so it's just it's a shit show it's yeah. absolutely a shit show yeah. and so that's why i'm so excited for today's episode because it's like well if we really dial it back you know like what are the big you know rocks that we can discuss of just helping people navigate that shit totally, well, yeah. can we start uh with nutrition i mean like in terms of a female perspective like 
What do you see as like some of the grossest offenders in terms of like information that's sort of dissuading, you know, females from really getting, uh, you know, the, that 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 proper information that they need? Lie number one. <laughs> Lie yeah. number one. Lie number um, one. I I think especially the past two to three years, keto and intermittent fasting have been the two most hot topics that I just wish like they would go away mm. because the reality of the situation is that you know it's like <clears throat> when we do studies more times than not we're doing studies on men and then we're taking that same information and we're applying it to individuals that menstruate and individuals that you know are able to bear children and get pregnant and have mm. babies. And so, you know, it's like we're we're studying an apple, but then we're taking that information and trying to apply it to an orange and we're assuming that the mm. outcome's gonna be the same and it's not. Right, just right? because they're both fruit. Yeah, like just <laughs> <laughs> just because they're both fruit, it's it's just not the same outcome. And so it's like when we're talking about individuals that menstruate and individuals that have a menstrual cycle, it's like, well, you know, ultimately, a body that feels safe is a body that's able to and wants to reproduce. And so if we're going extended periods of time without eating, well, that's, you know, compounded over time, that's a really fast track way to your body not feeling safe. Like, if if we're not regularly and reliably getting food, well, why would your body feel safe and able to grow and house a baby? Or, you know, same thing, like when we start talking about specific diet modalities, it's like, ultimately, like, if we really dial things back, it's like, we don't want to be excluding certain food groups long time, you know, for long periods over time. It's like, again, uh, most people, and I would assume most individuals watching this podcast, love being active, likely, you know, enjoy lifting and stuff like that. And so when we start talking about eating modalities, where we're getting rid of carbs, aka the very fuel source that typically our body prefers to run off of, well, same thing, you know, it's like, we might see that maybe keto is great for men. But, you know, again, it's like, can it work for women? Totally with an asterisk, because again, it's like everything works until it doesn't. And so we just have to be so careful. Um, and, and it's not to say that there needs to be, you know, specific dietary restrictions of, mm-hmm. of men versus women, but we just have to be more mindful of, again, you know, it's like women have a superpower that whether or not we choose to use it and you know, whether or not you want to have babies and reproduce, you know, it's like our bodies are just wired a little bit differently. And so our body has different safeguards and our body is going to react differently to different mm-hmm. inputs than our counterparts yes. that don't have a menstrual yes. cycle. So studies actually show that. They show that fasting um, can have negative effects on women sooner and more often uh, than it will with men. I actually experienced this with clients. So I would have when fasting became a thing, clients would want to try it out. And they and so like, okay. And I would talk to them about the pros, cons. Then they tried out. And I noticed with some of my female clients, they would gain a uh, kind of stress response sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, hair falling out. Yeah, they would have changes in their menstrual cycle, um, changes in their energy, where it would either be wired or tired more often than men. And then with keto... I know that there's been some stuff to show that women can often get thyroid issues from avoiding carbohydrates for too long. But really, if you go, and here's my opinion, forget all that for a second. If, if, and I think there's applications for both in specific populations, but if you completely avoid a, a macronutrient that's available everywhere, or you go for long periods of without food, and you're going into that already with a not necessarily healthy relationship with food, somebody comes to me, wants to lose weight, They've done the up and down dieting. They don't feel very good about themselves. They don't necessarily have a good relationship with food. And my answer is, here's the answer. Don't eat all these foods ever or don't eat for eight hours a day. I'm feeding this dysfunction and probably making it worse. That's one of my, well, my biggest well, issues. Yeah, like the way you eat and exercise should provide freedom and peace <laughs> of mind. and Not stress. Yeah, like not stress. But also it's just like from a quality of life perspective, it's like, well – you know, if, if we're talking about excluding carbs, it's like, well, how many food groups does that eliminate? Because that's suddenly you know, yeah. no pancakes, no breakfast cereal, no granola, you know, no muffins, no cakes, fruit, and, and you know, <laughs> yeah, no fruit. And it's like, should we, you know, some of those foods, like, do we want to be eating them every single day of our life for every single meal? No, but it's like, it, again, like we we want sustainable habits, and we don't want to be doing things that we couldn't be doing forever. And so it's like when we're leaning in heavily to these extreme 
taking measures, you know, sometimes you have to do that to achieve a goal or to achieve an outcome. But again, you know, it's like so many people kind of get broken by diet culture and so many people get these really disordered relationships and habits and and just ways of eating. And it's like, well, ultimately in the nutrition fitness space, you know, we're trying to go from point A to point B. And so if you could achieve the same outcome, but still be able to eat those foods and still be able to have, you know, the cake on your mm-hmm. kid's birthday. Why wouldn't you want that? Like, why would you want to have to white knuckle and and suffer and struggle if, you know, somebody could take you the other way, hold your hand and, you know, yeah, it might take you a little bit longer to get there. But I think that most people, you know, if you said, hey, you know, you're, you're trying to achieve this outcome, would you rather achieve this outcome? And it might take a little bit longer but you can still have the cake on your kid's birthday and you can still have date nights and maybe you can, you know, go out and, you know, have a drink on occasion versus like, hey, for the next six months, uh, you're going to eat this many calories and you're not going to go on dates and you're not going to, your travel is going to be miserable because you can't enjoy yourself. You know, it's like, there's still going to be people that choose that outcome and that's fine too, but most people want that other route. And so it's just so education based where it's like, how can we enjoy life while also effectively working towards our goals? Because then it becomes sustainable. Sustainable. I think it's the wrong people uh, gravitating to these diets for the wrong reasons. And that's because here's the thing. I think uh, keto and intermittent fasting have tremendous value uh, for specific groups. Um, if I have a, a client that I pick up and they have orthorexia and they cannot go a day without weighing, them, I love to teach them intermittent fasting to break those chains away from the food like that. And it's extremely valuable to that person. If you have someone that has severe autoimmune issues, the keto diet could be life changing for that person. But the problem is a majority of people that hop on these diets hop on it because they want to lose Wait, it's, I heard a friend who lost 20 pounds. And so they are going after a, a look or trying to a, a, go after a, a, a diet like this to lose weight. And the truth is these diets aren't necessarily great for that. And the problem is the diet, the, all the research to support these diets add that in there as, as a benefit. Oh, and it's great for losing weight. So then everybody thinks that, oh, this is what I should do to lose weight. And the truth is, listen, I don't want to demonize these two things, intermittent fasting and keto. There's lots of value in them. But I would say that the where the problem lies is that a majority of the people that gravitate to these things gravitate to them yeah. for the wrong reasons. And, and, and then the next one, which is that, you know, that you listed was like fat or carbs. It used to be fat, by the way. We're all of the generation where um, and we're, you know, older than you are. I remember when fat was the problem. Yeah, Everything well, was about it, fat. Wasn't Eating it fat Time Magazine fat. had like, it was like scrambled eggs and then like the bacon was making like a sad face. And oh, I forget yeah. what the headline was, <laughs> but it was like, that was yeah, like I one of the that. big things where it was like, fat is bad. And it's still like, if I work with clients that are kind of in like the, 45 to 60 age gap, you see that. You see that on food logs where it'll be like everything is like low fat yogurt, low fat this, you know, it's like you're only eating super lean cuts of meat. So it'd be like chicken breast, chicken breast, chicken breast, tuna, (laughs) tilapia, tilapia. Well, the grocery store still provides it. So that's how you know it's still a a, a prevalent problem in in, in our industry because there's still tons of everything, you low fat, non-fat stuff. We got hammered for decades, hammered for decades uh, that fat was bad for you. Literally, everything was about how bad fat was, which is uh, hilarious. There's the picture right there. We'll post that up on the on this video, but I, I it's crazy considering fat, especially fat, is an essential macronutrient. In other words, if you don't eat enough fat, you die. I don't care what your calories are. In fact, there's a condition I can't remember the name of it, but uh, trappers and hunters in the wilderness of the Midwest, you know, back well, I don't know, 100, 200 years ago, mm-hmm. some of them would starve to death, even though they would catch. Tons of rabbits, rabbits to eat, yeah, yeah, but they would that. starve because the rabbits were so lean. So they, were, I forgot the name of it, but mm-hmm. they actually, it was like rabbit starvation or something like that. And they would die or go mad because they didn't have enough fat. And here we are telling people fat is bad for you, which is now on that tip, do you ever, I'm sure you'd get clients like this. I used to all the time where, especially females, they show up, you talk to them about their food and you're like, uh, let's increase your fat and see what happens. And then boom. 
boom, my skin looks better. My hair looks better. I have so much more energy. I feel better. My libido's back. Like, well, you and see the, that? the thing is, it's like healthy fats are so important for so many different things in the body. So it's like if we're talking about, you know, joint health, if we're talking about, like you said, you know, skin and skin conditions, that's absolutely huge. Um, especially, you know, when we're talking about omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids, it's like if you have a super inflammatory diet, we can change a lot of those inflammation levels. And that shows up in things like your skin and your hair and, you know, how you feel in the day to day and how you recover from workouts. Um, dietary fat is so important for, you know, your thyroid health, your menstrual health, it, it, you know, it's a part of and helps, you know, with your hormones as a whole. And so it's like, again, like the, the best way of eating is when we're consuming all the things. And it's like, for sure, you know, if we're in a calorie deficit, we have to take calories from somewhere. But it's like, especially again, I tend to work with the population of individuals that menstruate. And so it's like, a couple different things, but it's like, I'm always going to be really mindful of how, you know, how low I'm taking somebody's fat levels, because you start to see that where it's like, you know, if, if somebody comes to me and they're like, hey, you know, I, I my menstrual cycle has been missing the past year or two. Um, and you look at food logs and you're like, oh, well, you're eating like 35, 40 grams of fat. Like, I'm not surprised. And it's almost like it, it's a joke, right? Because it's like maybe two or three months later, you start dialing up their food. Maybe they get up to, you know, 60, 70 grams of fat, and then all of a sudden, you know, boom, that's right like, and we're like, oh, shocker, like, the one thing that, you know, contributes to all this, so, especially with the menstruating population, it's like, we, we just want to be cognizant of that, and so, you know, it's like, everybody is going to have different food needs, but we kind of start looking at minimums, where it's like, you'll notice certain trends where it's like, well, if you're eating really, really low carb, that can be a, such a big driving factor for thyroid problems or hormone and menstrual cycle problems. Um, because again, you know, it's like most individuals, especially that are listening to this podcast, you're active, you like working out. So you're falling into that under recovery trap also. It's like, well, you're you're doing this exercise modality, but then you're not putting the fuel in the car that the car needs to do mm -hmm. the thing, right? Um, so it's like with both of them, it's like we have to find, you know, everybody's going to be a little bit different on how many carbs a day they can tolerate and how many carbs they need to you know, support their activity levels in the gym and outside the gym and stuff like that. But it's like we we really start to see issues when we go the extreme. So we don't want to be super low fat. We don't want to see super low carbs. You know, it's like we want to be eating yeah. all the macros. And, you know, the big the big no carb movement happened because uh, somebody capitalized on the fact that everybody was saying low fat for so long. So one of the most effective marketing strategies in the <laughs> go world the opposite. is go the opposite. <laughs> and you get a lot of attention. So, you know, Atkins comes out with his book in the 90s. And he said the opposite of what whatever everyone else was saying. And because it's low calorie, of course, you'll lose weight on it. And it just totally blew up. The next point that you came up with, I love because uh, I have, uh, you know, my, my son's 10 months old. So my wife just had the baby, you know, 10 months ago. And my wife is a trainer. She's been in fitness. You know, obviously I'm in fitness for a long time, but you still fall into this like, you know, right after you have your baby, you need to bounce back. And here's what you do to bounce back. Get back to your pr previous shape. And women feel so much pressure. Mm -hmm. And this is a challenging, and, and of course, observing this from the outside, I could see how challenging it is because- Well, and, and social media makes it work, yeah. <laughs> right? Like yeah. the issue with social media is it's like- Yeah, there's always that chick who's like showing she's two months <laughs> out, she's got ass abs already again you're like she did it yeah, yeah. and you know again it's like uh, this messaging towards the pregnant and postpartum community has always been prevalent but social media expedites it and you just see it more because again you know people are sharing their journey because it, it creates a way for them to connect with other people and 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 you know again it's like this blessing and a curse because yeah you know it's like you're expected to have this baby and then just oh you should you should be snapping right back and it's like the body doesn't work like that um i will give a shout out to meg squats who i follow on instagram because she is currently six weeks postpartum and so she had posted and uh, you know six weeks is when they say like, oh, hey, you're cleared to go back to exercise, yeah. like, woo. And so her caption was incredible because she posted a picture of herself and she said like, hey, y'all, like technically it, I'm cleared. You know, my doctor says, woo, you're good. And I'm not ready to go back to exercise. And she was fit as fuck, you know, prior yeah. to her pregnancy. Like she was, a you know, a power lifter and, and very in shape. And so I think that's so powerful messaging because again, you know, it's like, 
here is somebody that was so athletic and here she's struggling just as much, you know, postpartum. And it's like, everybody's going to have a different pregnancy. Everybody's going to have a different reaction. And then especially, you know, well, how many kids are we now having? Because it's like, I see, you know, I used to see that all the time with clients where it was like, you know, let's say kid one, you were at 100% and then you you had the baby and maybe now we're at like 80%. And then by kid two, you're like 60%. And, you know, it just gets harder and harder for most people with every pregnancy because it's like your body's going through such an incredible but such a stressful thing of growing, you know, carrying a baby for nine months, then, you know, we have the baby. And obviously, the actual, you know, giving birth is very difficult and stressful on the body. But then we slide into breastfeeding, you know, you're not sleeping a ton, you're not obviously, you know, super recovered for how many months, because you're just caring for Mm -hmm. this thing. And then we expedite, oh, hey, well, I know you just had a baby and your body just did this incredible thing the past nine months, but like now you need to look just like you did before. And it's like, that's not how it works. Like if if we have surgery, how many months does it take for us to get back to, you know, great, usual business? Great it's, point. It's a lot. Yeah, great point. I, the, the Here's a big one that I would focus on with pregnant women who had a baby who also worked out because it's a different challenge versus someone who didn't work out, right? The challenge was that they didn't understand, even if everything else felt kind of strong and, you know, your muscles have muscle memory and they're quite resilient, especially if you went into the pregnancy and you worked out during the pregnancy, of course, appropriately. But here's one thing that a lot of them didn't realize. Your core stability is different and it has to be, right? Everything stretches and grows and you essentially lose connection. So then they go back to working out and they're like, I can do barbell squats. I used to squat with 135, so I think 105 is fine. Mm -hmm. They go to do squats and everything feels okay. And then the next day, like, why am I hurting in my back? Like, and I'd be like, listen, your core has completely changed. We need to focus on reconnecting before you. Well, and pelvic floor. Oh my gosh. You know, it's like the the pregnancy, uh, the entire pregnancy thing is there's so many different variables. And like I said, everybody's so different, but it's like, it, it, being pregnant is expensive. <laughs> like you're going to doctor visits all the time, but then there's all these extra special steps where it's like you really like one of the best investments you can make would be to be working with a pelvic floor specialist totally. afterwards. Like especially totally. if you talk like the CrossFit community, that's super common to talk to moms and they'll be like, "Oh yeah, every time I do double unders or I go for a run, like I pee myself a little." And it's like that's a pelvic floor yep. issue that we can fix and address. Mm-hmm. But again, you're like, there's not a manual like, oh, hi, you just got pregnant. Do this, right. And so like, God bless communities like um, Lindsay Matthews of BirthFit. She is absolutely incredible and puts out such amazing content for, you know, the pregnant and postpartum community. But again, you know, it's like if I if you talked to me three years ago, it, the only reason why I know the importance of pelvic floor health. And again, you know, like you were talking about with core stuff and whatever, it's because I've worked with clients and I've like done the education around that. But most people don't know. You know, most people, again, it's like you you have this baby, <laughs> the doctor sews you up and you go on your way and you're like, well, six weeks, I'm gonna go back to exercise. And it's like, really, you know, if you, if you talk to a lot of experts in this space, most people are saying, hey, like the first couple months after you give birth, like, be doing a lot of core exercises and really taking it slow and a lot of restorative exercise. But yet, if you have somebody that was super active and they love exercise and they love doing it, well, yeah, like you want to get back to doing the thing you love and you want to get back to feeling good in your skin. But again, you know, it's just like there's there's this rush to get Mm -hmm. to get back and to bounce back. And the reality is, you know, how many people we give birth and then you're like, okay, three, two, one diet, like I need to lose this baby weight. And it's like, with clients, if I was taking one, I stepped away from one-on-one coaching years ago, but even, you know, in our Paragon training community, we encourage people, it's like, hey, you know, like, if, if we think about, you know, for nine months, your body expanded and accommodated for this baby, you should probably be just chilling and laying low mm-hmm. and just eating at maintenance, you know, if you're breastfeeding, worrying about eating enough food to support breastfeeding, but just letting your body recover and heal for at least nine to 10 Mm -hmm. months. And so it's like, for me personally, I've always been, you know, the long ways, the shortcut kind of person. And so for me, it's like, I would rather see a mom just eating at maintenance, you know, supporting breastfeeding, returning to exercise when it feels good, you know, really listening to her body, but just giving 
back to herself and giving mm. time to just recover. Yeah, allow yourself and, to heal. And I want to see that for, you know, one year, one and a half years, because the thing is, we have so many women in our community that they did that. And then because they waited, because they gave their body time to recover, they gave their hormones time to just, you know, rebalance and get back to a good space. And then when they diet, it works and they're yes. able to quickly, you know, get to where they're trying to go. But again, you know, it's like that it, 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 we talk about getting from A to B. And again, ultimately, it's it's your journey. It's your body. It's you deciding how you want to get there. And, and you're an adult and you get to choose you know, what you're doing. But again, if we could play the long game and option A is maybe we don't diet for a year and a half and we're just eating at maintenance and worrying about feeling good and, and just giving back to ourselves. And then we're able to do, you know, say a three month diet. It works. We don't have to go to insanely low calories. Maybe, you know, good point. You know, if maintenance calories, let's say we spent the past you know, year and a half, we're at 24, 2500 calories. Well, and we're able to diet at say 21, 2200 calories. We quickly lose that weight three months later. And we're, we're you know, we have this banging body. We feel really great. We look really great. Checking all the boxes. Reversely, option B, we have somebody that they give birth and then maybe they have to go really, really low calorie. And maybe their milk supply isn't great because they're still trying to breastfeed, but they're still trying to do this thing because um, they're really uncomfortable in their skin. And I totally get that. But it's just two totally different outcomes that, again, you know, a little bit of patience is going to create such a better setup for the future. Because, again, you know, you're efficiently able to get there. And, and more importantly, how are you feeling along the way? And, yeah. and again, the breastfeeding thing is a very sensitive topic, too. But it's like, well, ultimately, like you have a little that's dependent on your milk supply. So we just have to be cognizant of that, too, of like, is that really an appropriate time to be worrying about trying to change our body and, and all of that? And again, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. We have to choose what's right for, you know, what we feel for ourselves. But it's just two totally different scenarios. So I, how do you find what's right for you? I think the I think the psychological hurdle is uh, more challenging than at least what I thought until uh, I saw Katrina go through it. Right. So all of us, or most of us, I should say, um, got into exercise and fitness uh, because of our, you know, self-image, body image. Most of right. insecurities is what drove most of us to the gym. So you got to imagine that uh, many, many of these ladies that get pregnant uh, still have that. And imagine all of a sudden adding 30, 40 pounds to you and then your body feeling so different, looking so different. It's storing body fat in different places. And I remember Katrina going through this because Katrina, I've never seen her have body image issues. She's never calm like that. She's a very confident woman. And I remember constantly having to remind herself like, hey, you just had a baby. It's okay, hon. Like you're, you're going to get in great shape. Don't worry about it. But let's listen to your body and, and how it feels right now. Don't rush anything. There's no reason for us. And in fact, if you do that, you're potentially going to set yourself back even further. And who knows what else? And your number one priority right now is to feed my son and keep him healthy as possible, which means I want you as healthy as possible. We'll deal with the the, the, the self-image, body image stuff later on. But I actually, I think that's part of why this is so challenging. We're talking about a lot of the physical things that are that are, are challenging. But I also think there's a major psychological well, thing that happens to a lot of women that oh, see their yeah. body change so rapidly. Well, and we, I, I think one thing that I love about our Paragon training community the most because we are you know mostly women is that um, my very good friend Hillary that lives in Austin she was talking about this where it was like hey you know I, I went through IVF and here I went through pregnancy and I did the hard thing and I spent a couple months breastfeeding and I'm now ready like to just get back to feeling good in my skin you know like I did the thing I did my part and I loved that and I loved hearing that because in the pregnancy world, we have so much guilt and there's so much judgment. And it's it's almost a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation because people love passing on their opinion of, oh, you should breastfeed more, or you should breastfeed less, or right. you should do this, that, and whatever. And so I think, you know, again, just having the autonomy to, again, choose your journey for yourself and, and what's right for you and your body. But yeah, you know, mm -hmm. it's like also giving that permission card of like, how do you want to feel and what do you want to be working towards? And, and again, the only person that matters, it, it's for you. Like you, you, you yeah. brought this kiddo into the world. So you also equal parts, you know, need to do what's best for you. Yeah. Lori, you know, it's, uh, it, it definitely is a, a huge challenge. And I do want to say this, the people that I've worked with who say I had a baby or I had two kids, my body was never the same afterwards are the ones that rushed into it. 
because they went into it so fast. Not the pregnancy. I'm talking about the post-pregnancy working out. And they caused issues that they didn't solve later um, that later become harder to solve. You're talking about pelvic floor issues. If you don't work on those things and you strengthen everything around it, it can be very hard to even diagnose. And you start to, well, why do I keep hurting? Why does my hip keep hurting? Or why do I have these issues? You know, I'm working out all the time. I'm very fit. Then you got to go to specialists. And oh, lo and behold, there's some pelvic floor issues that happened 10 years ago when you had your kid. Now, you did mention calories. You said 2,500, 2,400 calories. One more point, uh, another point that you made uh, that we want to cover was this like 1,200 calorie number. Like you need to eat 1,200 calories to lose weight. I <laughs> think I think I know the origin of it. I'd love to hear your opinion. In my opinion, I think the origin of 1,200 calories is this is what we were told is the minimum. I remember when I first got my first certifications for nutrition, they said never have anybody go lower than 1,200 calories for whatever reason. So, of course, that's where people would set their clients. Let's start at 1,200 calories. That's the yeah, least. It's, it's a weird industry thing. And you know, I don't transparently know where it started, but it's like you see that all the time. Like if I walk into, say, you know, like a meal prep company or something and I buy some ready-made meals, it'll be like, oh, here's 1,200 calories for women and here's 1,600 calories for men. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> like what? <laughs> so um, I think that, you know, if if I could go back in time and, and I just wish there was more education about how much food we all actually need to eat to sustain and do the thing. Because again, you know, it's like, I think in the community of fitness, it's so easy to also hear information about general population versus, you know, well, yeah, if you sit at a desk all day and we don't work out, your, your calorie needs are going to be very different than someone who's lifting and, you know, doing the thing and, and totally, right? Muscle makes a big difference. But, but yeah, you know. and so there's so many factors that go into how much you need to eat. But same thing, you know, it's like when I, you know, was a teenager and I found myself, you know, I didn't know that I had undiagnosed thyroid issues, but I was, you know, super athletic, super active and I, suddenly struggling with my weight for the first time. It's like, same thing. I, I went to Pinterest. I went to, you know, pick up a, a Cosmopolitan magazine and everything you read was 1200 calories, 1500 calories. And it's like present day, you know, fast forward. Um, I'm 5'3". I probably, I'd say right now I'm lifting for about 60 to 90 minutes, four times a week, uh, pretty much following just a progressive overload uh, strength and conditioning program doing tons of bodybuilding. But it's like, at the end of the day, I lift for 60 and 90 minutes, four times a week. And it's like, for me, I need 23, 2400 calories to make And you're tiny, by the and way. I, yeah, like I'm you're, not tall. No, no, no. You're a tiny little thing and you're eating 23, 2400 calories. You're lean. Your body fat's got to be in what, the high teens at the most? I would guess. I, transparently, I don't know, but you're I, very you're very lean, obviously. But you have a lot of muscle. You remind me. I used to tell a story on the. Po I've told the story so many times on the podcast of how I had this female trainer that I would always use to sell training to new members because new members would you know especially women they'd come in and they you know oh I don't want to do the weights I don't want to get big I don't want to get bulky I don't want to do and then I would page this female trainer who looked very much like you right she was small petite whatever super and jacked I, yeah and I'd be like <laughs> exactly and I'd be like can you guess her body weight if you can guess within 15 pounds I'll give you a free membership for whatever and they'd be like oh uh, she's like 100 pounds like, all right, get on the scale. You know, she's 130 pounds. And I'd say, she looks tiny because she's lean, yeah. but she's got muscle. And then I'd be like, tell her what you eat. And then she'd be like, oh, for breakfast, I had four eggs, two slices of bacon, two pieces of... And she'd go through this like huge laundry list of food. And I'd be like, she can eat that much because she's got muscle. Yeah. That and burns the calories. Well, just, think, just think about the, the message you're sending your body to go the other direction with 1,200 calories. And by the way, too, what type of person is the type of person as far as that goes for that extreme calorie restriction is also normally the same person who goes for extreme exercise too. Mm -hmm. So if you, it's so usually both, it is, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. So that's the same personality that's willing to do the extreme dieting is also normally the same personality that will do the extreme training too. So then not only do they go 1200 calories, then they sign up for one of those orange theory F45 CrossFit classes, five, seven days a week on top of that. And think about what you're telling the body to adapt to and setting yourself up for it. Even if you did achieve your goal, even if you got to the body image, the image that you wanted, imagine how miserable you are training five to seven days a week and only I'm eating twelve hundred calories oh, for the rest of your life. It, Just beating sure. the crap out of yourself uh, forever. It's and you know what's here's the thing: in modern societies, you want a fast metabolism. This wasn't true ten thousand years ago. If I could survive on twelve hundred calories ten thousand years ago, I did better than the guy who had to eat three thousand calories. Today, it's the reverse. If I could get my metabolism to burn more calories then I'm going to fare better with the food because it's so we're surrounded by so much food. It tastes good. I'm not very active. So having a lot of muscle helps burn all those calories. 
So fast metabolism is a benefit nowadays, well, yeah, not a slow you're, metabolism. You're able to go on dates. You're able to travel and not be stressed out. You can just enjoy food and enjoy you know, so many experiences versus like the quality of life. If you're trying to only eat 1,200 calories or 1,500 calories, like that's tough. Dude, like, that's like that's... one burrito. Like, I can't <laughs> one, chipotle. <laughs> yeah. one chipotle. One yeah. chipotle, yeah. But so it's like if I could go back in time, I wish that I could tell my younger self like, You know, uh, there's just so there's this assumption and there's this messaging of like, I always grew up being like, oh, well, you're a really tiny individual. So you you just don't get much food. And that's how it is. Um, And the reality of the situation is like, that's uh, like, I love (laughs) that I was actually born a very tiny person. Because again, you know, it's like most clients that I'm talking to, or most Paragon members that I'm, I'm talking to, or people on social media, you're likely taller than me. So if I'm here eating, you know, Uh, well above 2,000 calories, you know, it's not uncommon to have female athletes that are 5'6", 5'8", you know, 5'10", and it's like, maintenance calories, 2,800, yeah. 3,000 yeah. calories. And and yeah, you know, again, if we talk on social media, you see, oh, full day of eating, 1,600 calories. And you're like, sick, dude. Like, what? Like, <laughs> so <laughs> that I think- That was breakfast. Yeah. So it's like, I, if I don't like making- generalized statements for the nutrition and fitness industry because there's so many things that go into this but you know if if we're looking at active menstruating individuals i would say that for most women you are going to see you likely need a minimum of 1800 2100 maybe you know again it, the more active we are and the more muscle we have the longer we've been training kind of the floodgates open up for mm-hmm. more leeway and more yep. food and how hard has it been for you to promote like with women to to live in a surplus <laughs> So I had somebody, um, not about surplus, but I had somebody the other day, they messaged and they were like, my husband doesn't believe that you eat as many calories as you say you did. And it is the same thing. I was like, I opened my phone. I'm just like, okay. And so I like stopped for a second. And so I was like, okay. So I like open up chronometer is my favorite like food tracking app. And so I made like a video screenshot. I like went back, you know, a week ago and it's like my present day tracking. I'm, I'm not really like trying to achieve a particular goal right now. It's like, I'm, I'm literally just lifting. We're in a strength cycle. Like I want to, yeah. Like I want to deadlift like 2.7 times body weight, which will be super rad. And I will for sure rip that. Um, wow. But, that's, that's pretty damn good. <laughs> you wait, it's coming. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's like at the end of the day, I track my food every day and I might have some days that's, you know, 2,200 calories. It, you know, maybe I did a lot of volume one day, so I might have 2,500 calories, but it's like, I'm consistently, like I said, you know, well, I, I'd say the, a good solid range, probably 23, 2,500 calories. I'm always aiming to hit you know, right around body weight and protein. And I don't stress too much about the carbs and fats. You know, if I'm super active, I'm going to have a day with more carbs. And then reversely, if I'm like, ooh, I sat at my computer all day long, like might have a little bit more fat, mm. a little bit less carbs. Exactly just cause, how we tell people. You know, yep. Just because that activity wasn't quite there that day. And so it's created, you know, it's like I said, I don't stress about food. I don't have a lot of the disordered eating habits that I had so many years ago because again, you know, it's just like, this is a part of me. This is what I do. If I don't track my food, I actually don't eat. So it's like, like I'm always super stressed out. I'm always super busy with work. And so I track my food to make sure I'm eating enough food because otherwise what happens is, you know, if I if I go without tracking for a few days, they'll be like, damn, I feel really terrible in the gym today or like strength's just not there. And that's like, I'll like track my food and be like, oh, well, you ate 1500 calories yeah. today. Like get it in, sister. Yeah. So it's like, for me, you know, I know that so many people find macro tracking, you know, super obsessive or super stressful, but it's like been doing it over a decade. And it's, it's just something that I do just like doing my laundry or going to the gym, you know, it's just part of my life. But for me, again, it's, <laughs> I love doing it because if I don't, I feel like well, garbage. You've developed a good relationship with it. You know, you've mentioned a lot of, uh, you know, people who menstruate or, you know, having your period and, and the changes that that can do to your body in the sense of how you might react to food and, you know, diet and exercise. Uh, one of the other points that you put up here was that women are told that their period is not important or that you don't need to have one. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, oh, your period is all over the place. We'll control it with this hormone or it's not that important. Like, why is this not a good message? Yeah. So ultimately, our menstrual cycle is one of the best underlying indicators of our health. And so we don't get a lot of feedback, <laughs> you know, about that from our body, right? But, you know, f- for individuals that menstruate, you know, it's like we should have a menstrual cycle. It should probably happen every 27, 28 days. You know, it should be relatively symptomless. 
But yeah, you know, the messaging that I grew up with, and I really didn't learn about women's health and hormones and all that stuff until literally I was 28 years old. And, you know, I was struggling with a lot of just symptoms and, and stuff. And so I started reading uh, the two, a couple of my favorite books is Laura Bryden's Period Repair Manual. Great um, book. Dr. Jolene Brighton, who y'all have had on a couple of times. She's incredible. Uh, she wrote the book Beyond the Pill. Uh, Laura Bryden has since gone on. She basically wrote a book for individuals going into perimenopause and menopause. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's called the Hormone Repair Manual. But it's like it wasn't until I read these books at 28 years old, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, that I started to understand, oh, it's really important to have a menstrual cycle. Whoa. But, you know, it's like uh, uh, there's so much messaging out there where it's like it's totally normal to have menstrual cycles that, you know, you have really bad PMS and it's totally normal to have cramps and it might be totally normal to like miss school or stay home from work because, you know, you're on the rag or whatever it is. And it's like the reality of the situation is like those are all symptoms that we might be dealing with hormone imbalances and mm-hmm. whether, you know, whether what what those levels look like with your estrogen, your progesterone, you know, totally different depends but it's like when when we understand that's a really good radar on our health well maybe we're an individual that you know we love training and we're, we're super into fitness and we're super into nutrition and our menstrual cycles goes missing and we just go oh well that's kind of cool like I, I really want to bleed every month anyway like the, this makes life so much easier like that should be you know it's like we can use our menstrual cycle as feedback from the body of oh, maybe my body's not picking up the things that I'm putting down. And whether that's, you know, our frequency with drinking things like alcohol, maybe that's, again, you know, the way that we are exercising. Are we doing, you know, are we training five to six days a week doing super strenuous, super high intensity exercise or reversing, you know, are we working out three to four times a week and, you know, putting in strength and conditioning or whatever is, you know, it's like our body is always listening, you know, it's like our body's always trying to communicate to us. But as a society, we've gotten really bad at being able to yeah. pick up the phone and listen. And so, so much of coaching individuals is getting people to reconnect with their body and, and pay attention to, again, well, you know, so many people use the scale as an index of their success and, and stuff like that. But it's like, when we're coaching people, we're getting them to look at, well, what are your energy levels like? What's your sex drive like? You know, how, how are we sleeping at night? Are you, are you waking up multiple times a night or reversely, you know, do you sleep through the night? Um, you know, how are you feeling in the gym? Are you regularly hitting mm-hmm. PRs? Are you seeing, you know, changes in your muscle and body composition? You know, if you're trying to diet, is it is it going successfully? You know, it's like when we start getting people to pay attention and kind of kind of step out of their body and start analyzing those things and the things that really matter versus just, you know, hyper hyper focusing on the scale that's where the money's at because again you know it's like if we're feeling really really good that's sustainable and that's what we're Mm. looking for right Lori, you're a good person to ask this you you said something that's uh, really interesting to me because i remember getting a lot of clients that would actually say things like oh i just i get really bad periods like Mm -hmm. you i have to stay home from work or my cramps are miserable i just have extremely heavy bleeding are there, um, do you, or have you seen like common offenders or they're common, like when someone says that to you, are there like a, okay, I'm going to ask this or look for this or look for this. Are there common things? Sure. Well, and I mean, I was one of those people. So it's like, for me, um, I was the kid that in high school, I had really, really bad cystic acne. I had periods that were so painful, so uncomfortable that I would miss school for you know, days on end. And so um, my mom did what I think most individuals experience is like you go to your OBGYN, they write you a prescription for the pill. And it's like, oh, dang, like my skin is suddenly clear and glowing. And oh, you know, like may- either, you know, I don't have a menstrual cycle anymore or, you know, everything gets better. And so it's it's a delicate balance of like understanding when we start doing things like taking oral contraceptives, how that might affect us um, in other ways. But it's like if somebody's dealing with all those symptoms, kind of like you mentioned, you know, it's like I was a little upset that there wasn't more discussion on, hey, well, actually, 
if you made changes to the way that you're eating and you made changes to the way that you're training, which, you know, I, I've always been an athlete. I was a competitive gymnast, you know, did competitive track, you know, in, in college, it was like I ran marathons and then got into CrossFit and, you know, present day, just kind of love bodybuilding and strength and conditioning. But it's like, I was always doing the most on everything. So it's like, if you talk to me in high school, well, everything I was eating was typical high school kid. Like it was super highly processed foods, you know, going out to eat at McDonald's, um, you know, caffeine and just tons of like sugar and, and everything was just stress, right? So it was like, I wasn't eating enough food. The foods that I were eating were probably super inflammatory and not great for my body. Um, I now, you know, present day, I know that I'm gluten and dairy free to support my autoimmune condition, but it's like, uh, for sure, as a high school kid, I was crushing, you know, bread and pizza and cheese and it, all the, all the <laughs> things that now present day, I'd be like on my deathbed if I tried to, you know, even have a couple of bites of that. Um, but, you know, it's like present day, I have really s- relatively symptomless menstrual cycles. And, you know, it's like if I didn't track my cycle, I, you know, it's like, it, you know, that day would happen. I'd be like, oh, start my menstrual cycle today. Whoops. But, you know, for most people, you know, it's like the severe mood swings. It's, it, you know, it's everything from feeling, you know, super crummy leading up to your workouts to some people feel really terrible during their menstrual cycle as well and just don't have that strength, don't have that power output. Um, and so it's like, if, you know, again, we talk about A, how, we, how are we getting from A to B? And so would you rather take a prescription and, and temporarily relieve those symptoms because the reality of the situation is if you got off the pill, if you got off the IUD, whatever it is, well, all those symptoms are probably going to come back. Um, but reversely, if we could just start eating, you know, a little bit healthier, if we could start going to bed at night, if we could change the way that we're exercising you again, are, are we doing super crazy workouts that are, you know, are we spending hours and hours in the gym? Are we doing the most intense exercise? Or reversely, it's like, well, c- could we achieve the same outcome and, and train a little bit smarter, a little more sustainable? Um, you know, again, it's like we get back to things like alcohol, the things that you're coming into contact with maybe in your beauty products and the sunscreens you use and, and stuff like that, right? So it's like there's all these factors. Digestion is another really big one where it's like if we have underlying gut issues, that's absolutely going to play into your thyroid health and your menstrual health and and all of that stuff, right? So it's like if you could reversely lean into a little bit healthier lifestyle and not have to take a prescription and then suddenly have symptomless menstrual cycles, I think like most people would be down for that yeah. cause. You know, you know, it's funny. I, I used to have uh, uh, someone who did hormone testing in, when I used to have my studio. She was really good, very holistic. And she said, you know, it's interesting. Having a period is actually from a health standpoint, a gift because every month, you have this really clear signal mm-hmm. that you're either doing stuff, some stuff right or some stuff wrong, which is pretty interesting. And then one more thing I want to comment on, you're talking about using a prescription to get rid of symptoms. Yes, it can and, and sometimes does, but also it doesn't handle the root cause, yeah. right? So you can, if you do all the stuff that gives you a better period and then on top of it, you also take the pill, you're going to be better off than if you just took the pill. Now, the next one that you listed is one that we talk about all the time, and I love. I would love to hear your perspective on it, is the message that you have to do lots of cardio to lose weight or get lean, uh, or you have to do lots of cardio to get the body you want. So why is this... Uh, a bad message that often gets sold. Uh, so to women. this message comes from love. Like if you met me, like in my early twenties and like college, Lori, like I was cardio queen. <laughs> like it's like we did it. Same thing, you know. Like ran ran marathons, and I I still present day I love running. Um, it's one modality that. I have super long legs, like I am a gazelle, like I can still, I don't even, like I said, I don't even run that often, but uh, I just moved back to Dallas and there's a 5K on like the Katy Trail and I was like, ooh, I kind of wanted, <laughs> I haven't emptied the tank in a while, like I should just show up and go like smoke some people, like this would be fun, right? <laughs> um, but the thing with cardio is that it's like, if you enjoy it, do it, but understand that like when we're looking at health benefits and stuff like that, you know, it's like, if we are getting activity out outside of the gym and we're getting 7,000, 8,000 steps a day, that covers us on the basis of cardiovascular benefits and just overall, you know, health and well-being. Um, But it's like, you don't have to do cardio to look good. You know, if you're trying to achieve a caloric deficit, 
you how however you achieve that caloric deficit you could do that purely via food you could do that partially you know via food and the way you're exercising but it's like we see so much messaging where it'll be like doing my steady state cardio for 60 minutes on the yeah. stair stepper. And it's like, <laughs> well, yeah, like, Every yes. bikini model. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> yes, you, you can do that. Again, you can create your caloric deficit via cardio. But reversely, again, you know, it's like when we're talking about you get to choose your own adventure and the best way to achieve your goals is probably to enjoy yourself while you're doing it. Well, if you hate cardio, understand that you don't have to do cardio to achieve a good body composition, right? Like ultimately, if we're talking about an athletic looking body, if we're trying to achieve that, well, that's probably a body that has a lot of muscle and, you know, a leaner body fat percentage. Well, you're going to achieve that likely via lifting heavy on a progressive overload program, or you're going to achieve that that body type through doing, you know, periods of caloric restriction and then going back to maintenance and then caloric surplus to to gain muscle and put muscle back in your frame, right? And so we're kind of whittling our body down. But it's like, again, if you enjoy cardio, by all means, do it. But I just feel, and again, I don't know if it's just social media, but I'm just like, if I could never hear the word cardio again, like it would be too soon um, because people ask that all the time will it be like whoa well you you lift really heavy you look great you're super shredded like how much car do you do you do and i'm i'm like i don't do any like every once in a while i might like go burn Mine's it down and run on the weekend right but and people are like wait what and again it's like there and i don't know if it's more just from like the bodybuilding world that it's just like they're obsessed with cardio but it's like again how do we get from a to b the most efficient it's like if somebody wanted to get a really banging body composition if they enjoyed cardio i would incorporate it as part of their plan but it's like you don't have to do it yeah. to you not only there. not have to do it but it's actually not the best strategy if you yeah. want if you want to maintain muscle because you're sending the opposite signal by running like crazy so i think i think that's part of the problem too is that uh, the, the studies that we used to do on people when uh, when it comes to like weight loss is all around law, law of thermodynamics, calories in versus calories out. So in, in an hour period of time, what type of exercise burns the most calories? And so I think that's where it comes from. I think it's just been perpetuated because of that. It's like, oh man, I could get on the Stairmaster for one hour really hard and maybe burn six, 700 calories. I'm not going to do that during doing weights, but again, it's not the full picture of what's going right. on. And it's not going to speed up your metabolism like lifting weights will. So if you're you're like the average person who's only, let's be honest, the average person is going to work out like three days a week. They're not going to do four, five, six days a week. And you're only going to pick one form of exercise. Do the one that speeds up your metabolism. It's just going to give you the most bang for your buck. Now, speaking of calories burned, the next one that you put up was people talking about paying attention to the calories burned on their like devices and stuff. So why the is this worst. an issue? Why is this a big problem? Like why can't what's what's the big deal with looking at my watch and be like, oh, I'm burning There's so many cool devices yeah. out there. Yeah, we just yeah, keep burning yeah, yeah. Man, like, and I think it's just such a disservice. Um, you know, it's like, I don't want to throw a company under the bus, but there's one in specific that they make a wearable ring. And so I have a Garmin, which like, that's what Garmin does is like tracks your steps and super yeah. accurate GPS. And so I was kind of messing around uh, with this wearable ring that a ton of my friends were like, oh, I love this thing because it's super great for tracking your sleep and, and gathering data around that. Right. And so I'm looking at it and it'd be like, it, however many steps my Garmin would say I would get in a day the ring would be like 2,000 to 3,000 higher every single time. So it was like- That's if, a selling point, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. so it's That's like- That's like cardio machine <laughs> saying yeah, you just burn like way more treadmills. <laughs> yeah, so it was like, if my Garmin said like, oh, you got, you know, 8,000 steps, like this little ring would be like 11,000, 12,000 steps and be like, fake news. Oh my <laughs> God. God. <laughs> but so, you know, so same thing. It's like, we have so many wearable devices out there and people love being like, oh, it, in, in my group exercise class, I, I burned 600. 156 calories and it's like y'all like our body is so complex and we can't be dumbed down to a wearable and yeah. if some company had figured it out we wouldn't have a, a growing obesity yeah. problem like i think i actually looked yesterday just because i was curious and like it they're now saying you know right around 70 percent of the population in the united states is either overweight or obese yeah. so it's like well if your apple watch if your garmin if your whoop band like whatever it is if they had cracked the code and figured it out like they, I mean, they, A, they'd be well, making a hell of money right now, but it's like, yep. we, we're still not there yet. No, Maybe Lori, we will be. But. No, I tell you what, if you took a wearable that tracked calories and steps and all that stuff, and you put it on the Hadza tribe of Northern Tanzania, I talk about a study that was done on them that, and there's other studies that have been done on other modern hunter gatherers, 
But scientists went down, studied this modern hunter-gatherer tribe. So they literally move all the time. They hunt. They don't have electronics. They live in huts. And they found at the end that they burned about the same amount of calories as the average Western couch potato. potato. Why? Because your body learns to adapt because otherwise you would die. In the wilderness, you're not going to get six or 7,000 calories worth of food. But if you put these devices on them, I guarantee you would say five or 6,000 calories. And it would be totally wrong. They're not burning five or 6,000 calories. And the scientists actually used very sophisticated metabolism testing to figure that out. So I'm 100% with you on that. Well, it's not also, accurate like, often. What do those numbers mean, right? Because right. it's like, well, okay, let's say even if you did burn 600 calories in your workout, like again, it's like, I feel like that's such a 90s way to like approach our nutrition, fitness and health and be like, oh, on, on the elliptical today, I burned X number of calories. Mm -hmm. um, today I ate this many calories, so I just need to subtract. And it's like, again, like it's just not, it's not It'd be nice way. if all that math really lined up perfectly. <laughs> right. Right? Well, the, yeah. the metabolism is just so much more complex yeah. than that. It's like ever moving and changing. So for you to think that you could follow this little tool that tells you the calories, yeah. and, and if that even matters mattered that much. And you know, Sal said the other day, I think it's like one of, it's actually maybe one of the worst ways for people to, to track or measure whether they're doing a good job in their fitness or not. There's just, it's so much more complex. Well, and what they find is in. that when, when the average person sees this for, they did this one study where they listed calories. They, there was this like citywide mandate. All restaurants have to list, yeah, list just calories. Makes them eat more. It just makes them eat more. And, and they did. <laughs> they actually tracked it and people ate more because instead of saying, wow, if I eat the burger, it's 300 calories more. I'm going to eat the salad. They said, wow, the burger's only 300 more calories. Yeah, well, I, I burned 600 calories yeah. in my class so I can have two glasses yeah, of wine. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, really what happens. So it can definitely Always backfire. <laughs> Another thing that you said, now you mentioned earlier you have a goal of deadlifting, what did you say, two and a half times your body weight? Or? So I have deadlifted two and a half times was our last strength cycle. And so this time we're going 2.75. 2.75, okay. So the next one you listed here is that women will uh, still believe often is that lifting heavy, will make them look bulky or manly looking. Um, this is Why is this totally false and why is this uh, damaging? I, again, I'll say it's like a, when I was making this list, a lot of them were like, I was thinking back in time to like either things that I fully believed <laughs> or things that, you know, you know, things I see, you know, coming up with our members and clients and stuff like that. So it's like if you met me in 2012, when I first started strength and conditioning, I remember walking into a gym and the owner was absolutely jacked. Like she used to do, you know, physique shows and stuff like that. And like just such a badass athlete. Like she was actually like a regional CrossFit athlete, um, competed multiple times. But so I remember, you know, it was like here I was, I was at the depths of my eating disorder. I was literally 92 pounds when I found, you know, the barbell and it saved, you know, it completely changed my life. But so, you know, I, I stroll into this gym and I remember thinking, you know, wow, this workout was so fun. Like, I can't wait to keep lifting weights. Like, this is, this is so cool. But mutually, I remember looking at this individual and in my head thinking, ooh, but I just don't want to get, you know, big like that. And mm -hmm. like now I'm like, what? Like, yeah, I, yeah. I wish I could get that. Yeah, you know like, how hard that is? <laughs> like, like my, my best friend Alex and I talk about this all the time where we're like, man, like, we've been training a decade and, like, we're still not huge. Like, how do we get bigger, yeah. right? Like, how do we get more jacked? Like, it's just, you know, a breach of my genetic potential. Fuck. <laughs> um, but it's like, we're not genetically made for that. Like, women don't, like, we are. And I, and I do want to add, I do want to add, you've been working out consistently for years. You lift weights like a bodybuilder. You also probably have exceptional genetics considering you're a high-level com com competitor in sports, which means you worked hard, but also have really good genetics. The average person could lift weights all they want, and what they'll probably accomplish after years of doing so is a sculpted, you know, toned or whatever body. Yeah, it's like you don't lift heavy enough to get big. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, that's yeah. that's really the hack, yeah, right? You so go a long like... way. <laughs> they're saying that as they're lifting like sixty pound deadlift over there. You know, <laughs> but it's like, we got a ways to go before you get yeah, that bulky. I like, promise. That's you know, that's always like our our talking points in our group. And again, you know, it's like the population we have. Like my ideal, like best day in life would be that 
you know, somebody joins our programs and they've never lifted a weight in their life. Like that would oh, be... Oh, you get to show them the magic. Yeah, like let's let's go, right? But it's like, you know, so many people would be like, oh, like I'm I'm really scared to get big or I'm, I'm really scared to get bulky. And it's like, y'all, like I'm dead. <laughs> it's like if I'm <laughs> hip thrusting, God bless anybody that's in Lifetime because all the 45 pound plates are gone. Like I'm hip thrusting 400, 425. Like wow. you, you ain't squatting today, right? <laughs> um, and so it, it's like, again, it's like, here I am, five foot three, you know, present day, probably 120 pounds, something like that. And it's like, I'm, you know, I, I can deadlift 300 plus pounds. I can hip thrust 400 plus pounds. Like I'm lifting heavy and I'm still not big. Like, how do I get bigger? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I, that, that myth cracks me up. And what it does is it scares women from doing the most effective exercise. Yeah, and, and, and doing and the one it. thing they need and to do. Not totally. to mention, okay, it is so hard to get there and it's real easy to go the other direction yes. so i would always tell my my female clients that would skip me like listen we're gonna try and make you look like arnold and yeah. you just let me know when you wake we'll up one morning when and you feel you're too happening. closer and then go ahead take three days off and have a cheeseburger you'll be yeah. just fine yeah, yeah. No, you ain't gonna wake up tomorrow looking you know, like oh my i knew it ah I, I told them not to have me squat 55 pounds now i look well, like lou farino and yeah. it's like the word toned you know it's like i i hear that all the time where the there will be comments so it'll be like, oh, like, how do I get toned like you? And it's like, y'all, like, the athletic physique that you are describing, again, is a body composition that likely has more muscle than you have now. And yes, it might have less body fat, but it's like so many people get caught up in the cycle of, oh, I just need to lose body fat. Like, if I just lose body fat, I'm going to I'm gonna have this physique. And it's like, y'all, like, if you lose that body fat, you're probably going to look like a melted candle. <laughs> like, that's, that's the body composition. I do, want, I do want to point out, though, because there is there is an exception where you do get this and because there's somebody listening right now I know for sure that's like I don't care what they say I've done lifting before and it's made me look bulky whatever. but many times they haven't addressed the inflammation gut issues they're eating they're not eating appropriate for what their goals are and then they go touch some weights and then their their pant size or something totally. goes well, dirty well also though right like we have to remember and this was this was on the list as well is that fat, you know when we're talking about fat and we're talking about muscle they're two different types of tissues. So again, if we want to bring back up the fruits and apples and oranges, like fat is the apple, you know, oranges might be our muscle. And so it's like, we can't turn one into the other. Right. We, we can't do that. That yeah, doesn't that's exist. That's called alchemy. We've proven that years ago. <laughs> you have to be really good doing that. some wizard stuff, right? And so yeah. that was something you know, most people don't realize because people say like, oh, well, like I'm really overweight. Um, you know, I just want to, I want to turn all this, this fat into muscle. And it's like, well, they're two different types of tissues. And so back to Adam, you know, your point, it's like, well, yeah, if you go from not lifting weights and you start lifting heavy, you are going to start building muscle. But that doesn't necessarily address the body fat issue. I don't want to assign the word issue, but it doesn't address the body fat component that we have in that situation. So it's for that person, it again comes back to education of, hey, you know, right now you actually might see, you know, the scale go up because again, we're we're adding muscle to your frame. Your, your body's doing mm -hmm. what it's supposed to do. This is good. Um, you know, at a future date, we do pr likely want to go through a caloric deficit if you're wanting to lose some of that body fat. But again, so many people uh, get bought into lifting and they're like, okay, and it's cool until again, you know, you're mm -hmm. like, well, my clothes don't fit. Everything's starting to get really tight. Uh, the scale's going up. And so it's like the edge education of again well the mm. long game that's something that will have to be addressed if that's important yep. to you yep. but nobody has that conversation so again it's like there's still not the education understanding around a lot of not this. to mention fat takes up more space per pound uh than muscle does and i do want to make this comment the percentage of women that can build muscle to an extreme extent is about as rare as the percentage of people that are seven feet tall so if you think about everyday life, like how many times have you run into someone that's over seven feet tall? Like never, you never see that. That's how rare it is to have a woman that, and if you're this woman, you know, like you don't even lift weights and you look like Justin um, because you have those uh, those kinds of yeah, genetics. That's... Now that brings us to the next one, which is the low reps versus high reps. Like, oh, low reps, bulks, high reps, tones or sculpts, like... What's the problem with this particular message? I feel like this is again like where the '90s like still leaks totally. in the present yeah, day, yeah. and you're just yeah. like, what? <laughs> um, and it, I think again, it, this whole like, oh, I should only 
do low weights and I should do high reps. Like that's still coming from kind of that that fat phobic place of I don't want to be in a bigger body or I don't want to be bulky or toned. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think it's just so... It's so tough because, again, kind of like we were talking about earlier in the show, typically for a lot of male athletes, you know, especially if you were playing football, you were playing baseball um, or any sort of sport, you were likely doing strength and conditioning and you were likely in the weight room. And so you already had some exposure to, you know, hopefully what a good training program might look like. But I think a lot of women likely resonate with me where it was like, oh, I didn't start lifting weights until I was 22 or 23. And like, I remember being in the gym and being like, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm on the I'm on the machines. I'm doing the thing. And like, <laughs> you know, and, and so it's just kind of this bad information thing. And so I think like one of the most powerful things that someone can do is just follow a good training plan and follow one that promotes being evidence based, you know, like avoid following workouts from, you know, your, your favorite person on social social media or um, maybe you're getting, you know, random workouts off of YouTube or like I know when I used to do CrossFit, it's like there were there was like a couple different big companies out there and it was like Invictus and Misfits and Comp Train. And so it was like you would like cherry pick. And so it'd be like on Monday, we're going to do Misfits. And then on Tuesday, we're going to do <laughs> Comp Train. And not realizing that programming is like yeah. <laughs> all connected and long term. Right. And so it's like that was a really hard learning curve and I, I didn't understand like why I wasn't getting the results I was seeking and and you just see you know it's like this isn't uncommon for somebody to you know maybe on Monday they go to spin class and then on Tuesday they go to boxing and then on Wednesday they go to you know an F45 class and it's like well it's important that we enjoy the way we work out but again we have to understand if the way that we are exercising you know is are the inputs matching up with the output or the outcome that we're trying to achieve and mm-hmm. so it's like being very clear on where we're trying to go and how to most efficiently get from A to B. But it's like if we're talking about strength training or we're talking about like, hey, I want to build a really strong athletic looking physique. It's like, well, you need to find a progressive overload program. So it's going to be a program that has weekly repeating movements. So maybe you know, every Monday you're back squatting. And so the goal over the course of that, you know, 12 or 15 week training cycle is, well, we want to increase difficulty every single week. And so if I open the cycle and I'm squatting, say, 200 pounds that first week. Well, hopefully that second week I squat 205 and then I squat 210 and I squat 215. So that again, you know, by the end of the cycle, cool, I can hit PRs. We see strength again, you know, we're, we're repeatedly performing a movement so we can get better at it. We can build muscle, our body gets stronger. And so for so many people will be like, oh, well, I, I get bored of workouts really quick. So I want random training or, or this and that, or like, I need to confuse my muscles. Yeah. Like that's another, like, I don't even know where that came from, but like, please, I hope it burns a fiery (laughs) death right but it's like the honest reality is like the more boring your program the likely it probably is because we can't get better at something we're not practicing i love that point because that was the so when we first started right uh the number one complaint right that we would get our feedback from maps and a ball from maps and a ball was I know what all these are all this is just the basic squat de- I know these exercises It's the shit that yeah, works. Yes. It's yeah. like, that's why it's there. Yeah. Just yeah. straight away. Yeah. Get back Stick to us in two, two months. I also think part of this problem though too uh, uh and why this one won't die is uh, so you have these uh famous, you know, Instagram girls that got famous from a television show or they they don't they're not even a real fitness professional and maybe but maybe they put fitness coach in their profile or whatever, <laughs> but they really don't know shit about exercise and training, but they're beautiful. They got a, a the beautiful body that a lot of people like and aspire to to have and they're doing all these circuit training, glute mm-hmm. kick, you know. Here's a brand new exercise. Band, 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 yes, yeah. band <laughs> exercise with, you know, 40 this, 30 that but and just your heel, it really works so the inside I think, part. And, you know, we talk about they got millions of followers for whatever reason. They were famous on a reality show or whatever like that. But I think there's a lot of that on, on social media. you got someone like us who've got, you know, 90 to 100,000 followers. And then you were competing against this famous girl who's got 4 million followers that everybody knows. And she's gorgeous. Yeah. And, and she's giving this advice. So I think that's part of the reason why no, this one doesn't die. It's 100% part of it, though. Because the thing is, it's like, you know, with me, coming from a nutrition background and having you know, a bachelor's in food, nutrition, dietetics. It's like, uh, you know, it's like I helped manage numerous CrossFit gyms over the years, um, worked for CrossFit seminar staff. And, you know, I, I've been coaching now for over 15 years, which is insane to me. Um, but it's just like, 
I've never been passionate about the programming side of stuff. And I was never passionate about like the one-on-one PT side of stuff. Like I loved group coaching, but miss me on programming, miss me on just understanding how to do all of that. And so when we founded Paragon Training, like my business partner, Brian, he's been training for 20 plus years, like, and he's so nerdy and he loves it. We're such a good balance because I'm super nerdy about nutrition. I never get tired of it, but he's the same way where it's like spare time. He's listening to podcasts. He's digging into research, PubMed, um, you know, all this stuff. And so it's, it's so crazy because again, for so many years, I was following various workouts and various programming and, and CrossFit and this and that, whatever. But it's like my best friend Alex and I, we both have been training for a little over a decade now, which is a reasonable time. You know, it's like once you've been training for a while, you're not going to see PRs and strength gains like when you, you know, the first couple of years, like every time I step in the gym, uh, you know, a yeah. PR, 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 right? But it's always so fun. And I love this where it's like, here I am, you know, training 10 plus years. And like I said, you know, it's like our last strength cycle, I had a 25 pound lifetime PR on my deadlift. That's and it's awesome. because Brian's programming is so good, right? And so even, you know, we we just started a strength cycle again. And so I'm like looking at the 12 weeks and I'm like, okay, if I want to deadlift 315, that means, you know, this is what I, you know, I'm like doing the backwards math on like how to engineer it. But it's like, I know that I'm going to hit it because our programming works. And so here we have these high training ages and we're still regularly seeing, you know, st- you know, changes in strength and changes in our lifts and that's how it should be right like it's it's actually not super normal to be hitting these plateaus like certainly if we're talking about like a win- olympic weightlifting yeah if you're lifting at a high level and you're already squeezing out 98 percent yeah. already yeah. like you you're, you might grind for like three years to get that next you know two and a half pound jump or whatever but it's like when we're talking about our general population well you're gonna notice you know it's like our lack strength cycle we literally had members and it wasn't just like one or two. It was literally hundreds of our members where it was like, wow, 12 weeks later and I hit a 20 pound, 50 pound, 100 pound PR. Like the number of women that we had hitting their first 300 pound deadlift and you're just like, yeah. Cool. yeah. But again, you know, it's just the difference of, well, these are all individuals that they came from the hey, well, I was doing- Never had something legitimately programmed. like years of just CrossFit or years of marathon training or whatever. So you get really intelligent programming that's prioritizing recovery and that, you know, again, we're we're just letting the body do its thing. Like, holy smokes, man. It's a science. Programming, workout programming is definitely a science. And here's the truth. Low reps, high reps, they all build muscle. And Mm -hmm. it's just how you program them in your workout- uh, determines whether they work. One doesn't tone, one doesn't bulk. They both build. There's building and they're shrinking. That's all muscles do. The last point that you bring up that I think is very important is this myth that an effective workout is one that leaves you dead. Like crawling on the floor. <laughs> yeah. I'm sore for days. Like if I don't survive this Martyr workout. workout. Yeah, like I, if it doesn't beat me up, then it wasn't effective. This is one of my favorite ones to hammer because I think we all fell for this ourselves and it was the biggest game changing moment of my life for my own training when i realized that if i left two in the tank per set or if i left the workout feeling better than i went into it my body would totally progress and it would progress consistently yeah and and we were talking about this you know off air before but it's like again you know it's like in your 20s like that's fun <laughs> like you're like miss you know like catch me at the gym for hours on end and you know it's like it's fun to do those workouts no doubt you know like still every single year uh, my oldest brother uh, actually got into crossfit a few years ago and so it's our family tradition that every year we'll do the famous uh, memorial workout murph together and oh, so we'll cool. go do push-ups pull-ups you know run the whole shabam and it's our little like family bond thing we take her sweaty selfie after and it's just you know it's awesome and and same thing, like it's so funny because I'm so far removed from working out in that way that I it's always like a good reminder of like, yep, go back to, you know, working out the way you work because it's like it's, you know, when I switch to more bodybuilding and strength and conditioning style workouts, the the biggest change that I immediately noticed was the difference in my mental clarity and, and you know, how I felt after workouts because it's like. If I were to go do a CrossFit workout, at whatever point I left the gym, 
I felt like a zombie. You know, it was like I couldn't, you know, my work day ended at whatever time I went to the gym because I would leave myself, you know, rolling on the floor, redlining, max out. And, you know, it's like, again, that's fun. But we also, again, if we come back to this whole like, well, what goals are we trying to achieve and how how do we most efficiently get from A to B? It's like if we could work out in a different way and work out for less time, um, feel better and more quickly achieve those results, like would we want that? Because for most people, absolutely. Totally. Um, and so it's like, again, you know, just understand that inherently exercise is stressor. Like that's the point. That's how we achieve, you know, those adaptations, whether that's losing body fat, gaining muscle, getting stronger, hitting PRs, whatever it is, like that's, <laughs> duh, that's, that's it. But it's like, well, maybe... We, we don't have to go super hard in workouts. You know, it's like with our programming specifically, we encourage people to basically lift two to three reps from failure. And and it's a hard yeah. learning curve, especially if you come from, totally. you know, like the, the CrossFit style land where it's, and, and I again, I struggled with this for probably the first year and a half of, of struggling where I'd feel like, you know, my business partner, Brian would text me and be like, that uh, you were struggling pretty hard on those squats. Like you, you were grinding or those were really long reps. Be like, yeah, it was great. And he'd be like, you should go less weight next week and be like, what? But, but, I'm, but I'm trying to do the most. And so it's like, it's just, again, this understanding that we don't have to do the most and that, you know, intelligent training is going to help us prioritize recovery. Yep. And recovery is the secret sauce to adaptation. So it's like- That's like, when it happens. <laughs> yeah. That's when you adapt. It's funny, as uh, when I would manage gyms and have trainers working for me, when I could finally convince trainers to train their clients this way, because I would tell them, your clients should leave with more energy and should leave your session feeling better than they walked in with. And it was a struggle because a lot of trainers were like, no, I got to beat my clients up. The ones who adopted it had clients that stayed with them longer and were more successful. They were more. They were worried of the opposite. They thought if they didn't beat their clients up, yeah. that they would lose clients and they were going to be a successful. People aren't going to lose weight. No one's going to get in shape. But when they actually incorporated this, they became more successful because, uh, you know, newsflash, people like to feel good. <laughs> so it's like- <laughs> Strange. Yeah, it's like you want to feel good and it's much more, you're going to be much more, I don't know, it's much more sustainable to show up to your workouts and feel good afterwards. It's less likely to be sustainable knowing that at the end of your workout, you're going to be dead, especially when you're tired. Maybe you're not motivated like we all get sometimes. Like it just, or you injure yourself, which is another big one. Dude, and as you get older, like that's the biggest thing, right? Like we, we Justin and I was telling him about this yesterday where it's like the older I get, that is my number one goal is like don't get injured. Mm -hmm. And not just like in the gym, but it's like, you know, if I go snowboarding, it's like, don't fall, don't fuck this up, yeah. don't get injured. Cause it's like, I <laughs> just want to keep being able to come to the gym. I want to be able to do the things I want to do. It's like, there's nothing worse than being injured or dealing with this nagging knee pain or hamstring pain or whatever it is. You know, it's like most people have kids and a family that they want to keep up with. Or again, you know, it's like the gym is just part of their life. And so you don't, you know, it's it's really hard to to have a positive attitude towards exercise if you dread it, right? So for, yes. when we're talking about those personal trainers and stuff again, where it's like, oh, yay, I get to get punished and, you know, I'm going to not be able to squat the next day and I'm going to be on my hands. You know, it's like reversely, well, yeah, if they had a personal trainer where it was like, if the experience is like, well, yeah, like I worked really hard at the gym, but I felt great after. Yes. And, and, you know, I'm able to just show up as my best. You know, it's like it, it's so difficult to explain how, you know, air quotes, how hard to go in a workout. Right. Because don't get me wrong. It's like when I'm going for, you know, hitting another PR in my deadlift this year, it's like. I'm going to meet Jesus on a couple of my reps and, you know, it's like we're, there's going to be some grind and it, it, it'll be great, right? But it's like explaining to our members, you know, because people will be like, yeah, so I did today's workout and uh, I think I want to add more stuff. And you're like, oh, well, you, you didn't go heavy enough. Like uh, the, if you chose the weights right and you were lifting two to three reps from failure, like your legs were shaking, you, you got out of breath and it was hard. But again, there's a difference between challenging versus again, like it. redlining, yep. maxing out, potentially injuring yourself. And it, it's very hard. That's something that it takes time to develop that understanding but again you know it's like if you're if you're coming out on your training cycle too hot well you're gonna plateau in the later parts mm -hmm. of the, you know of the cycle this is a science thing 
And we, get, we get so caught up in a, it's a motivation and discipline thing all yeah. the time that it's just like, oh, the more I do, the harder yeah. I push, yeah. the more results I get. But it's like, no, there's, there's a science actually to this. I, I'll tell you what, we often work out in the morning before we podcast. Okay. If you went back 15 years or 20 years ago, I would not be able to podcast after my workout because my workouts were so brutal and ridiculous yeah. that I would have literally sat here <laughs> and it would have been the worst show of all time. Yeah. Now, we work out before we podcast because we we finish the workout and we're jazzed. We yeah. feel great and we actually do... Your biceps look huge. Yeah, maybe. And we <laughs> yeah. do a better... Main we, reason every time. Point we got, it's, I got yeah. the special <laughs> camera yeah. on there. We do, we do better episodes as a result of it and that's how you should feel after you work out. You should feel better not feel worse. I tell you, it's always fun to have you on the show. Always fun to be around you. One of the reasons why we had you on is we want you guys to get more people to work under you and to hire you guys because there's not a lot of people in our space who are doing it right. So yep. we really appreciate Super what you're doing. Yeah, you're yeah, we really, really appreciate sure. what you're doing. So keep crushing and we hope you get more people from this episode. Always a good time. Yep. Definitely. Thanks y'all. No problem.